21. On the, on the right, Francis Yates, one of the greatest historians of the Renaissance. Her books on magic in the Renaissance are foundation stones of the history of Western esotericism. On the left, Michael Dummett, professor of logic at the University of Oxford, mostly known as an analytical philosopher. He also published a book on the tarot in 1980. The game of tarot from Ferrara to Salt Lake City. Shortly after the publication of this book, Francis Yates reviewed it in the New York Review of Books. Her criticism was rather harsh. She wrote that Dummett's claim that the tarot cards never embedded any esoterical content before the 18th century was unconvincing. You have the full quotation in your handout, so I'm not going to read it. Michael Dummett took the blow. He replied vigorously in the same journal a few weeks later, sarcastically dismissing Yates' answer, Yates' criticism as baseless, and firmly maintained that no occult significance was attached to the cards, nor any use made of them save for playing games until the 18th century. Again, the full quotation is in your handout. Unfortunately, the death of Francis Yates, a few months only after these exchanges, put an end to the controversy. Now uncontested, now uncontested, Dummett's opinion became dominant in the academic world. Quote, no occult significance was attached to the card, nor any use made of them save for playing games until the intervention of Cour de Gébelin in 1781, unquote. My intention today is to do justice to Francis Yates' main objection. She wrote, she wrote that she couldn't find any serious iconographical attempt had been made on the Tarot de Marseille. Indeed, this deck is generally considered the prototype of all esoteric tarots, but its origins remain much disputed. So let us now investigate its iconography. I shall focus on a subset of the trumps which I call the authorities. They are the Pope, the Popus, the Empress, the Emperor, and Justice. I call them authorities because they all represent figures of power seated on thrones and wearing or holding emblems of power. They are often considered difficult to interpret precisely because their narrative seems unequivocal. They just look like traditional medieval representations. I am going to show you that these five cards all derive from the same series of engravings made by the Florentine engraver Baccio Baldini around 1470. The theme of the series is the prophets and Sibyls. And here are two samples. The 24 prophets all belong to the Old Testament, while the 12 Sibyls refer to pagan women who were said to have prophesied the advent of Christ. One of the prophets, Baruch, Uh, was taken as a model for the Tarot de Marseille's Pope. Same seated position with the body in front view while the face is in three quarters. 
same type of long coat, similar face features, particularly the beard and mustache, the mouth, the chin, and the nose. The Pope and Baruch wear different kinds of headgear, a tiara for the Pope, a toque for Baruch, but both hats are topped by a round button, and this button is in both cases perfectly aligned to the top of the frame. It is also striking that the hands appear to have been exchanged. The Pope's right hand imitates the gesture of Baruch's left, and likewise, the left one imitates the, the Baruch's other one. And you can see that the likenesses are such that the hands can be graphically interchanged using photo editing software. So here it is. Let's turn to Prophet Habakkuk. The Popus obviously borrows her main features from this figure. Her position, seated and in three-quarter view, is the same as that of the Prophet. They both hold a book on their lap. Last, the likeness of the left arms is striking as they are both covered by a similar hemmed sleeve emerging from a fold of the coat. However, Habakkuk's book is closed, so the likeness is mainly with the right part of the figure, like this. Where does the left part come from? Let's examine the Libic Sibyl. Here again, we observe the same posture with the book on the lap. This time, however, the similarities appear on the right side. Notably, the line of the coat's opening under which the book emerges. Also, the faces bear matching features, the rings around the eyes, the lines of the noses and mouths, the dimple on the chin. Moreover, the hats, even if they are different, are both conical and extended by a veil. So the Popus appears to be derived from the combination of two figures, a prophet and a sibyl. The spot the similarities game continues with the prophet Elisha. The emperor card borrows him its general design with the seated body, the head in profile, and the position of the arms, the face features, and a strand of hair that transform into the ear protector of the emperor's helmet. The spiral shape that can be observed at the end of the scroll held by Elisha is reused at the same position just under the emperor's left hand as a volute at the end of the throne's armrest. From prophet Elisha, the emperor inherits the face, but also an architectural element of the setting, which becomes just slightly modified, the throne's backrest. Again, two sibyls are the graphic sources for the empress figure. The Cimmerian sibyl provided its seated position in front view, the draping over the legs in inverted mode, and the right arm's gesture. However, the book was neglected. The Delphic Sibyl's right arm inspired the gesture of the Empress left. But the horn was transformed, in, transformed into a scepter. It can be better observed in inverted mode. So using the appropriate parts of both Sibyls, we can reconstruct 
the whole empress. You have also the comparison in your handouts. Finally, the Eritrean Sibyl provided many elements for the tarot's justice. Same posture, viewed from the front, with a sword in the right hand, the pommel placed on top of the knee. In both figures, the left arm makes the same gesture, the hand being held at heart level. Finally, several details are found in both figures, the pleated color, the belt, and the movement of drapery over the legs. Given the way the designer of the Tarot de Marseille used the prophets and Sibyls as a library of forms, chances are high that he designed his cards no more than a few years after the publication of the etchings when they circulated among the artists in the Florentine workshops. So, in all probability, the Tarot de Marseille cards were designed in Florence around 1475. Why did the creator of the Tarot de Marseille take as models this series of etchings for the authorities' trump cards? To understand, we need to deepen our investigations of the series of etchings. We shall see that they are not what they appear to be. Under each figure of prophet or Sibyl, eight verses are inscribed, supposedly summing up his or her prophecies. In a recent article, the art historian Charles Dempsey pointed out that two of these octaves were inspired by a famous astrological treatise the great introduction to astrology by the Persian astrologer Al-Bumazar. Here is a translation of the verses inscribed under the Cimmerian Sibyl. So, these verses paraphrase a passage of Al-Bumazar's great introduction to astrology. However, Al-Bumazar's text does not refer to the prophecies of a Sibyl, but to the astrological sign of Virgo, and more precisely, to the first of its three decans. And here is Al-Bumazar portrayed on the frame of a 14th century astrological clock. Albumazar's treatise was popular in the courtly culture of the Renaissance. In Ferrara, for example, the famous astrological frescoes at the Schifanoia Palace, painted in 1470, represent Albumazar's decans as human figures. And here are the three decans of Arius. And here is the first decan of Virgo at the Schifanoia Palace. Our next clue is the number of prophets and Sibyls. Why do we have 12 Sibyls and 24 prophets? Since the late antiquity and during all the Middle Ages, the list of Sibyls counted only 10 names. Things changed around 1430 when Cardinal Orsini ordered a fresco to be painted on the walls of his palace in Rome. Unfortunately, this fresco was destroyed, but we know it represented 12 Sibyls, with some captions referring to Albumazar's decans. The two additional Sibyls are Agrippa and Europa. Twelve, of course, corresponds to the number of signs in the zodiac. Thus, the number of Sibyls rose from 10 to 12 in an astrological context. 
the art historian Laura Ackerman Smoller calls such emblematic images the astrological sibyls. Now, why do we have 24 prophets in our series? Here is the list of Baldini's prophets. In Christianity, the tradition refers to four major prophets and 12 minors. These are, so to say, the official prophets of the church. If we study our list, we see it includes the four major prophets, highlighted in blue, but only nine minors in yellow. However, it features other figures of the Bible that do not belong to the traditional lists. We have, for example, Noah or Moses or David. Indeed, these biblical characters sometimes has been, have been considered as prophets, but many others could have qualified. And here you have a list on the right of potential candidates that have been omitted, including three of the minors. So the list of prophets in the Boldini series appear to be arbitrary. Now, if we add our 12 prophets to the 20, our 12 Sibyls to the 24 prophets, we get 36. 36 what? Well, 36 is the number of decans in the zodiac. And we have seen that the Cimmerian Sibyl in fact represents the first decan of Virgo in the zodiac. Therefore, chances are that each figure in the Boldini series personifies a decan of the zodiac. Now, if the authorities of the Tarot de Marseille are inspired by a series of images representing the decans of the zodiac, should we conclude that they also represent decans? Not quite so. Indeed, they are not what they appear to be, but it's not the decans. In various articles and in a forthcoming book, published by Scarlet Imprint, I demonstrate that the Tower de Marseille was created around 1475 by the Florentine savant Marsilio Ficino, one of the most famous sages of his time. He revived the great mystics of antiquity, translating, among many others, the Corpus Hermeticum, then attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, and the complete works of Plato. I will now show that under the guise of the authorities, Ficino featured the protagonists of Plato's myths exposed in Book 10 of the Republic. This myth tells the story of a warrior named Ur who died on the battlefield but resuscitated and thus narrated his sojourn in the afterworld. He explained how he met goddess Ananki, or justice, with her three daughters, the Moira of Fates, named Lachesis, Cloto, and Atropos. Then he described how these feminine characters attributed their sort to the souls through an intermediary identified as a prophet. And here is a 19th century representation of Ananki and her daughters, according to Plato's description in the Republic. Note the spindle that the goddess are manipulating with their hands. Indeed, Ficino's commentaries of, on this myth appear to perfectly match the figures on the tarot's authorities. Ficino identifies goddess Ananki with necessity or providence or divine justice. 
Justice is precisely the name of one of our authorities' cards. Moreover, Ficino writes that the Pythagoreans relate justice to number eight. In the Tarot de Marseille, the card of justice bears precisely the number eight. Ficino also highlights that Ananki is holding the, the spindle of the fates, quote, pictured as the axis of the spheres which befits the twin poles and the center, unquote. And we can see how the scales in the justice card correspond to that description. The beam likewise being ended at both extremities by twin circles and standing on its center. Moreover, Ficino writes that the goddess, quote, turns the spindle between her knees. She revolves the heavens at her knees, that is, at her lowest part, unquote. Likewise, in the justice card, the scales are held between the knees of the feminine figure. The inferior part of her dress could thus represent the heavens which the divinity rules using the instruments she manipulates. If we imagine we were observing it from underneath, the viewpoint of humans contemplating heavens, then the blue drapery of the dress would look like the night sky, while the sword's pommel and the pans of the scale would appear as three round yellow shapes on the blue background of the fabric, and we might interpret them as stars and planets in the sky. Ficino adds that the daughters of Ananki also have thrones and crowns to show their authority. Together with their mother, they turn all heavenly things. Likewise, the popes, the empress, and the emperor all have thrones and crowns, and we shall see that they also manipulate heavenly things. Now, here is an antique representation of Ananki's daughters. Note the shape of the spindle. the shape of the spindle held by one of them and the scroll in the hands of another. The first fate is Lachesis. Ficino also calls her Pallas or Minerva or Sophia or Philosophia and defines her as the divine intelligence. He identifies her with the goddess referred to by Proclus in the following epigram. I am whatever is, whatever will be, and whatever has been. No one has lifted my veil." Unquote. Ficino also gives a description of her dressed as uh, as a high priestess, quote, Plato was the first and only one to worship Sophia fully. He was the first to gird her temples with the priestly mitre and to robe her in a peplos worthy of the daughter of Minerva, unquote. So under the names of Lachesis, Minerva, Pallas, Athena, Sophia, and Philosophia, Ficino portrays a feminine goddess sitting on a throne, dressed in a peplos with a veil, crowned, and wearing a sacerdotal mitre. All these details are reunited in the figure of the popus. Furthermore, she has a book on her lap, and a traditional attribute of God's wisdom as book of nature 
or Book of the World, which Ficino himself had compared to the astrological heaven. The second fate is Clotho. We can recognize her in the Tarot de Marseille as the Empress because of the description Ficino gives of her hand gestures. Indeed, he asks why the fates manipulate the globes with their hands while their mother does not. He then answers, Quote, Cloto takes hold of the larger orbit from the outside and turns it with her right hand, unquote. We can recognize the globe on the top of the scepter, which we can see as an axis. To rotate the globe, Cloto necessarily uses her right hand. The second fate, the third fate, is Atropos. Ficino then writes, Atropos holds the smaller orbit from within and with her left hand. Likewise, the emperor's left hand exerts its action on the orbit materialized by his belt in such a way that the scepter's rod remains outside. Let's now return to Lachesis. In his commentary, Ficino also interprets Lachesis' gesture. Quote, why does Lachesis touch the globes with both hands? This is because the middle and the end are contained in the beginning, unquote. Likewise, in the figure of the Popus, the woman is holding her book with both hands, and we already hypothesized that it could be the book of nature. Indeed, in Ficino's conception, the living world can be seen as a book containing its beginning, its development, and its end before it is opened, and whose content is progressively revealed all the while his pages are being turned. Lachesis is the one who attributes to each soul her fate, However, this is not done directly, but through an intermediary called a prophet by Plato. The Pope corresponds perfectly well to the prophet. Ficino highlights that he is seated on a desk, signifying his authority and judgment we can see that there are two smaller figures under him, which we can interpret as the souls awaiting to pick up their destiny among the lots proposed by the prophets. Now to sum up our discoveries. We have a subset of five cards of the Tarot de Marseille, inspired by different images in a series of etchings that secretly feature astrological decans, but the figures on the cards, in fact, illustrate a platonic myth. Now, let me ask the followers of Dummit, why on earth would any sensible person undertake such a complex achievement only to play a game of cards? The answer is obviously that it was designed for other practices. In accordance with Ficino's writings, I will now propose two possibilities. Divination, um, sorry, initiation, divination, and talismans. One, initiation. In a letter to his patron, Lorenzo de Medici, Il Magnificent, Ficino explains that his most precious teachings were revealed only to those capable as Oedipus to solve an enigma. You have the full quotation in the handout. Now, the Tarot de Marseille's Arcana probably rank among such initiatory enigmas. Two. 
divination. In his commentary on Plotinus, Ficino explains that every event occurring in this world is accompanied by signs and that reading such signs can allow skilled persons to tell the future as though in an act of reading. See the full quotation in the handout. These signs, Ficino explains in another text, can be the shape of clouds or the flight of birds, to which we could also probably add the images on the tarot cards. Three, talismans. Finally, it may indeed also have been used as talismans. In his treatise on life, Ficino explains how to make talismans by engraving images in metal. That is, as in the process of etching. Then he gives as example a talisman made from the image of the first deacon of Virgo. As we have seen, this astral figure was represented as the Cimmerian Sibyl in the Boldini series, an image that inspired the Empress of the Tarot de Marseille. Indeed, these two images, that of the Cimmerian Sibyl and that of the Empress, are strangely akin to talismans as they could be produced according to the process described by Ficino. I cannot finish, sorry, I cannot finish this presentation without declaring the winner 42 years after the fight, <laughs> meine Damen und Herren, Mesdames et Messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, by posthumous decision, the winner of the match is Francis Yates, hail Francis Yates, all-time world champion of the early esoteric tarot. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>